Hey guys, if you're new to my channel, I like palm trees and I grow them in New York. We're gonna take a look at the front yard first, but then I'm coming back here, so let's get started. I just wanted to do a really casual video on this beautiful first weekend of June here on Long Island, New York, which is a zone 7B for all the gardeners out there who aren't from this area. I love bringing the tropics, but I also wanna eat some good old veggies too. So I'm gonna show you how I have used my very small space and really maximized it with pretty plants and pretty productive plants too. But first let me turn around, show you the pretty plants. So this is a northern exposure, gets lots and lots of shade. So I have a Fatsia Jepcona, which actually survives the winter here outside, and it's evergreen, so it's beautiful. But I have a couple in pots too. Same for camellias. I have a couple of camellias in containers because I want them to, you know, take a back seat this time of the year. And it just sort of, you know, fades in the background really beautifully. And then I pull them into a spot kind of closer to the front of the house where it's enjoyed for its flowers during the springtime. Look at this beautiful New Zealand flax. I actually have it hidden behind my shrubs just to sort of like give a little pop of interest. Look at the dogwoods blooming in my neighbor's yard. We have hydrangeas coming soon too. Even the neighbor's dog loves it. By the way, I told you I'm maximizing space. So let me show you my veggie garden that is in the middle of my lawn. Do you see it? Let's take a closer look. My backyard gets a lot of shade during the darker days out of a year. There's like a big tree, a tree that just like shades the whole entire backyard. And meanwhile, my front yard, the lawn gets tons of sunlight. So I was like, who needs this lawn? At first I was going to do an in-ground garden bed, but then I decided I'm going to have a raised garden bed over here instead. Interestingly, it looks like the slugs have taken the marigolds out. So these marigolds were beautiful and now they're just sticks, which is pretty sad. But I did plant the marigolds the intent attention of protecting the tomatoes because they're just a really good catch crop for pests. I'm really excited because this is an heirloom tomato variety. You can see the zucchini. I mean, this is awesome. Everything's doing really well. I just fertilized with some fish fertilizer, the Alaska brand stuff, and lots of sun. Really good ventilation is so important for zucchini. Otherwise, it's going to have fungal issues. So that squash variety is zucchini rampicante. It is so vigorous. You can see my... Um, little water container over here. Do you see that? So that little water container is what I use to fertilize all of my plants. So I literally fertilize everything by hand. Also, if you turn around, do you see the banana plant over there? That's a Musa Beiju banana and that does survive the winter here. But do you see that there? That is an Incente Morelli. You can go back to some of my earlier videos and see how I overwintered this in my garage. It is the fastest growing in the springtime out of the banana plants because it can handle so much cool weather. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six new leaves. And it's only been outside for two months. We're gonna flip the camera and I'm gonna show you my garage and driveway area. All right, so you could ignore the little loading zone that I have going on here. These are my mom's plants. She lives on Staten Island, so I'm going to have to bring that uh, to her this week when I go visit and work on her garden because I take care of her garden as well. But I wanted to show you how I've lined my driveway to maximize space. Like, why have no plants in my driveway when I can have really... Uh, productive and kind of pretty plants like this grapevine. I have two citrus over here. This is an Owari Satsuma, which produced a ton of fruit last year. And I think it's going to take a break this year because there's a lot of good foliage growth, but I'm not getting any flowers. And then my Meyer lemon did not produce fruit last year. And now I have tons and tons of flowers. You can see them from here, but we'll take a closer look in a second. So what I've noticed with my citrus after, and really any fruit tree after a really heavy productive year, it's going to take a break. This is my first time ever growing grapes. I started it um, on sale. I got most of my plants on discount at the end of a year. So this was October 2022. So it's been in my garden for almost a year and a half now, or actually a little more than a year and a half now. And it is flowering for the first time because it does bloom on the dormant buds from that second year of growth. So do you see this woody growth over here? This was overwintered um, and these were the dormant buds from last winter that have now sprouted. So you are only going to get flowers on the dormant buds. So you'll notice that it's kind of close to the main trunk, these blooms. Each of these clusters of blooms could become a cluster of grapes. And as I mentioned, that whole entire thing is in a pot. So really cool. 
I'm also doing blueberries in pots. The birds won't bother this right now because it's not ripe. Look at all the blueberries on it. I mean, if each of these are 20, that's like, you know, 20, 40, 60, 80. I mean, there's gotta be like 200 blueberries on this shrub. It's going to, pr it's gonna ripen in June. So um, that is when I will cover this up with netting. At the moment, nothing is bothering it. The, the animals really only start to bother the blueberries when they turn blue and start getting tasty. Uh, this blueberry has struggled. It's called Jelly Bean, I think. Let's look at the tag. Yep, Jelly Bean. I don't know what the story is with this. But my paradise this year are my hydrangeas. This is gonna be a banner year for hydrangeas in the Northeastern US. Why? Well, we had a very warm winter, first of all. We had very, very consistent moisture. I'm a meteorologist, by the way, so this is like my thing. I love when the weather actually cooperates and we get a really, really good growing season out of a deal. Uh, most importantly, not only did we have a very warm winter, but we didn't have quick cold snaps. The weather didn't change on us on a dime. The year before this one was an actually warmer winter overall on average, but the hydrangeas, the fig trees, they didn't do well because we were hitting 70 degrees in February, which is literally unheard of on Long Island, 70 Fahrenheit. Um, and that's like t more than 20 degrees Celsius. That's ridiculous for winter on Long Island. But um, then we got really cold. Their juices were flowing during the winter time and then the freeze would knock it back. But this year it was mild and we did not have that like back and forth with the temperatures. And obviously like everything is thriving. I've never gotten a single bloom on these hydrangeas uh, since I dug them out of the ground and put them in containers. And now I have more blooms than I can count. I have a couple more citrus. I have mint. Mint is a very misbehaved plant, so it stays in a pot. Um, I have this croton that I overwintered inside and I just threw this in a pot. We've got some mums, those come back every year. We have some honeysuckles. The garden is just lush, lush, lush. The peonies just finished. This is an Easter lily that I got for a dollar after Easter. They don't bloom during Easter time. Look, see, we're not in Easter, it's June. We're getting blooms now. So they're forced into bloom for Easter, but they are not technically an Easter blooming plant. But it actually stayed green all winter. And this is my persimmon tree. How cool is this? <laughs> so anyway, I can't wait to eat this. I had one fruit from it last year and I actually got it last year. So what a win. I actually ate fruit from it as I planted it, there was already a fruit on it. Um, this is a really cool variety because it's a non-astringent persimmon. If you've ever had a persimmon that wasn't ripe, it sort of like tastes like you're eating cotton balls. That's what it feels like. It like takes all the moisture out of your mouth. That's an astringent variety. This one does not have to fully ripen to still be really nice and sweet. And it's not a big plant and it will produce fruit even if it doesn't have another fruit next to it. So it's not like an apple tree where you need cross pollination to get fruit. I'm also doing blackberries here. So the blackberries are gonna kind of ramble with the persimmon. I have some dahlias. I'm growing some ginger. This is just an ornamental, a very pretty ginger. We have some cannas. So all of this is just gonna fill out and look pretty. There'll be flowers, there'll be fruits. It's gonna be a good old time. This is like my favorite view in the backyard right now. I have my windmill palm that survived the winter, but then like, look at the pond, the koi fish. That's my likuala palm. That's kind of going through a little awkward phase right now. My Vanda orchid. Um, this is a beautiful Malaysian orchid. It's a Mendelina. And look at how the flowers just hang down. And you have the fountain. I mean, how relaxing is this? This is a philodendron. And then this is my Musa sicamensis. That is a red banana, but what's interesting is, is that as it gets older, it produces less red splotches. Last year, it was a baby, and I had so many red splotches. This year, not so much. Queen Emma crim crinum lily. My spindle palm is doing well. That alfina ginger, that overwintered inside the house, a begonia vine. And then if you look all the way in the back, I have impatience, and then I have a fatsia jepcona, which I have in the front yard as well in the in the pot in a container but this one is in the ground and just look at that color again this gets shade all day long and it is loving its life i have the deciduous azalea over there that just finished blooming and the blooms were so fragrant and i put these little polka dot plants do you see those 
underneath them just to add like a little interest and texture. We have some hostas and hydrangeas. Actually, the hydrangeas are starting to bloom and I love this time of the year when the hydrangeas start to bloom. I thought it was kind of unusual that my hydrangeas in shade are blooming earlier than the ones in sun. But I'm not complaining. I'm enjoying the extra color. Speaking of blooms, this is like the most epic house plant and I always like to take it outside to get some sun. But you could keep it inside. This is a clivia. How beautiful is that? I have so many house plants. So every single plant that is on my patio right now is from inside the house. I did not buy any new tropical plants on this patio right now. So we're going to flip the camera and I'm going to show you the trouble I've gotten myself into. And the good news is that these were actually really easy to overwinter. The reason why I'm stressed isn't because they were hard to overwinter. It's just because they take up a ton of space inside the house. Outside, they're such a pleasure. So this Bismarckia palm, I brought it in and out throughout the winter time. It can handle temperatures down a little bit below 30, so it was actually okay. I planted the dahlias um, from a nursery, and I love the way that that beautiful silver, um, you know, trailing plant it just like complements the silver foliage so nicely of the Bismarckia palm. This is a mango croton. Doesn't produce mangoes, unfortunately, but it looks pretty. This is an old man palm. Look at that fibrous trunk. I got this in 2018 when I lived in Florida and it has been with me everywhere. This is a Singapore twist tea plant right there. Do you see that? right there. So this um, is struggling a little bit after this winter. It did better last year out inside the house, but it's alive and um, all of this is new growth. So this is going to look really pretty in a few weeks and it's huge. I'm going to flip the camera. It's actually about as tall as I am if you include the pot size. Look at that. Is this not beautiful? I think it's so pretty, but um, yes, it is not in its best life right now. It will be. What I love about it is that it's 2D. So when you flip it like this, especially if you look at this, you see how it, all the leaves grow in a single plane. So it's, it's just got this very unusual look to it. This is my biggest palm tree. It's a Gauzia princeps, and it is native to Cuba. I was pretty nervous that this was not going to do well inside the house because I thought it would require a lot of light to survive, but it actually did pretty decent. Um, I have a false agave, which got very burnt in the sun, so I am so sorry because that is my fault, false agave, but it's growing back. It's going to do okay, and I actually caught it for free at a nursery in South Carolina, um, and it's been following me for years now because I have been in New York for two years years. This is a flamethrower palm. This frond is starting to get ugly, right? And um, that's because I have noticed that it only keeps three fronds at a time. But the fronds are literally bigger than me. They're, they're so much they're so much longer than the plant is tall. And so that new frond will turn red as it unfolds. And it is going to be stunning. Stunning, I promise. This is an adondola, a Christmas palm. Um, and it's a rescue, so ignore its state. I rescued it, and um, it's struggling a little bit. So uh, this is a Dixonia Antarctica. It's a hardy tree fern. I have a Philodendron gloriosum over there. It's got like a little shine to the leaf, which is interesting. And a Ficus taniki, of course, which is a house plant, but does very well in a shady spot during the summertime. I also love um, this beautiful bromeliad that I put with another really pretty house plant, which is my lady palm. Uh, very, very tolerant to being inside the house. My bird of paradise bloom exclusively in the winter time. They're just chilling here for the summer. I have to do a little bit of pruning, a couple of dead leaves over here. Coming to life though are plumerias. These bloom during the summer. Once they get their leaves, they'll usually also produce some blooms. Some years they take a break. This one had a lot of blooms last year. Um, so I don't know if I'll actually get any blooms. This one I believe is called the California Sunset. I might get some blooms from it. Um, they kind of look like little little balls of cauliflower when they're blooming. So let me show you one that does have blooms on it. This is an even better example. It's called Jackie. And you can see the flower buds that are growing before the leaves. <laughs> so I call up. it cauliflower. It's not, it's not edible like cauliflower. I just need to preface that. It's just that broccoli and cauliflower are an inflorescence, which is a structure filled with buds. And this is also a structure filled with flower buds. So one of those 
flower heads will produce hundreds of flowers on a plumeria. So this is my blue Mediterranean fan palm, and it's a little more cold tolerant than the green form is. The pansies are almost done now, but here's what's interesting. Those pansies have actually been blooming since October. So they have now bloomed October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, eight months, now nine. That is pretty amazing. And because I'm Italian, we got to do the lettuce leaf basil, which is just such a big, beautiful basil plant. And I've got some, some beautiful chives. Do you see those? They're actually native 508 chives and those flowers are edible and delicious. Kind of tastes like onions and they come back every year. So an awesome plant. And I have a couple more citrus here. I've got a kumquat that's variegated. You have one, um, fruit that's still on it and then I have my ponderosa lemon to the right over there and that is a huge huge lemon variety uh, I just love this view behind me so next to me is a peach mandevilla it says giant peach I'm a little disappointed with the bloom size this is the first year I've seen this variety it's not as big as the classic pink ones are but I'm willing to be really patient with it and see where it goes definitely very big are my clematis blooms you can see one of my um, bananas over there there we go, a little bit easier of you to see. Um, my bananas, they're, they're, like, um, <laughs> they're like a goal post, my neighbor said, it's true. Um, so right now you just have one leaf on each one because the Musa bananas are slow growing in the cooler weather. The Incente, the red bananas are so much faster this time of the year because they don't mind the cooler weather. Not that it's been really chilly, but they really like it hot, these bananas. So I've got leaves popping up they're going to grow a leaf a week once it gets really hot outside and it's going to be huge. I can't wait to see this view in a couple of weeks. The clematis is growing alongside a star jasmine, which is a very subtropical plant. So it's really cool to see that combination together. And I do have a couple of flowers on that. They This all overwinters. The can is all overwinter. The bananas go in the garage just because I'm trying to get them to be nice and tall. And this is my little veggie garden over here. I have cilantro, kale, cauliflower, beets. And then on the other side that looks a little bare, I just planted some zucchini and some tomatoes. So this is the planter bed in the backyard that gets a little too much shade during the darker months out of the year. So like once we get to September, October, this is like full shade almost. I just put some straw down. so. I kind of like this look a little bit better. Before the straw, it looked a little messy. This is my Siam Ruby Banana, which last year was amazing. This year, a little bit of a disappointment so far because it hasn't gotten hot enough for it, but look at all this new growth. So it's gonna be okay. I heard horror stories that Siam Rubies were really hard to keep inside the house, but actually it did very well inside the house and it only started to struggle outside because the stems are so, so thin. I have a needle palm here. I also have another banana that I believe is a Musa Velutina. I'm gonna take off some of the dead leaves because I'm so tired of looking at them, but I'm just tried to kind of let it be for as long as possible, just that way it can get some energy. Anyway, yeah, here's the yard. In addition to the needle palm and the windmill palm, I also have a sable miner back there that got pretty damaged by the snow, but no cold was an issue. Um, this ginger, by the way, is called Vanilla Ice from Plant Delights. It has got the most incredible scent. Ginger all came back this winter. These were in the house and in the garage. I always keep some of my ginger inside just in case they don't come back, but every one of them that I left outside came back. In fact, this butterfly ginger is not even in a protected part of the house. Like, I figure maybe against the foundation it would have done well, but this is like the worst spot, the coldest spot in the whole entire yard. And I have butterfly ginger coming back so beautifully. Uh, so again, this is my little planter over here that I, planting bed that I created. Um, I have a little fireball vermilion that adds a little pop of color between the banana. I can't wait for this to leaf out. Right now it looks so awkward. <laughs> 
I'm growing this banana that's a cross between a blood banana, which is a Musa Zebrina. Look at those undersides, how dramatic, and a Grand Nan. So this is an edible banana that will produce red bananas. I'm so excited. Um, but this goes inside during the winter. The quarter line that you see here, Australia spike plant, as we call it up here, uh, that survived the winter, no problem. And then my ginger over here, the Hetty Chiams also survived the winter. This is a Panama hat palm. Do you see it? It's actually not a palm tree. It is more related to prayer plants. And it did so well inside the house this winter. And I'm so excited to watch it grow because it has just a couple of fronds are all it gets, but it gets like really, really big. Like it could get like five, six feet tall. And it's just like, think um, like a papyrus plant, but like prettier. So I have my ponytail palm. I'm experimenting with a couple of different types of hibiscus. I have a variegated spike plant that goes into the garage during the winter, but I wanted to show you the ginger that's popping up. This one's called Daniel Weeks. It is so cold tolerant. It was the first to start showing signs of life, even before the classic butterfly ginger showed signs of life. And it's also the first to bloom. I don't get blooms for my ginger up here until like October sometimes September if I'm lucky, but this one starts blooming like the first week of August and it's already getting pretty big. It's kind of in competition with that um, ginger that I just showed you before. By the way, that little um, plastic goes on the sunflowers in that barrel at night because the birds are destroying my sunflowers. But anyway, it's a really vigorous ginger. We've got four stalks on it. What's really cool about that ginger is that it doesn't get floppy. Sometimes the heady chiam gingers, they, you know, have such big um, and very, very beautiful, yes, flower heads, but very heavy that they start to like sag. But this variety is a little bit stubbier. Um, the fronds or the leaves only get up to about the fronds on the palm and then they start flowering. So they flower at a height that's about the size of the fence and they don't flop over, which is really cool. And I'm trying two passion vines. This one is Maypop, which is a Southeast native. I have the non-native hardy passion vines that are really invasive at my parents' house. Um, and they're not really invasive up here. They don't always survive the winter up here actually, but they are invasive in the Southeast. And with a warmer climate, we always have to be careful of that. But if you're not familiar with passion vines, those are the blooms. And yes, they really do look like that. And they're huge and they're amazing. And I'm obsessed with them. And then I'm also growing this variety, Lady Lavender. And where's the, um, I just potted it up. It looks like I lost the tag to it. Uh, but this is called Lady Lavender and it's gonna be so beautiful when it blooms. So I potted this one up because this one's a tropical one. I also have a Trachycarpus Wagneriatus um, and I have a Monstera Thai Constellation here. So we're, we're having fun. All right, so uh, that's about it. A lot of times people ask me like, oh, do you like to relax like by the pond and stuff in the chairs, <laughs> which are right over here? Um, and the answer is that they're basically for decoration because when you're a gardener, you don't sit down on the garden. Let me know if you can relate to that.